These days, Microsoft and their Xbox are one of the big names of the video game industry, part of the big three with Sony and Nintendo. This wasn't always the case though. The 90s were dominated by Nintendo early on, with NES and the Super NES, and later by Sony with the PlayStation. Both absolutely crushing the competition, and Sony aimed to go one further, replacing itself as a replacement for the home computer with the PS2. During this period, Microsoft had almost total control over the home computer market, with Windows 95 taking the world by storm, and amongst its other achievements, making the internet easily accessible to households all over the world. It was around this period that the advancement of home consoles began to make Microsoft nervous, fearing that they would potentially threaten the role of a PC within the home, with their ability to both play games and movies, as well as install Linux in the case of the PS2. Microsoft wasn't entirely new to the gaming space, publishing games since 1979, with several very well received titles such as the critically acclaimed Age of Empires series, although they have never really made any attempts to get games onto consoles. With the PS2's announcement, Microsoft CEO Bill Gates decided that it was time for the company to embrace the rapidly expanding video game industry and take the fight to Sony. Development on Microsoft's entrance to the console market began around 1998 with four engineers taking it upon themselves to start thinking about how to use Microsoft's DirectX in a console. For those unaware, DirectX is a line of application programming interfaces, or APIs, developed to handle the various aspects of game development. They handled everything from graphics and netplay to sound effects and music, and have become the cornerstone for developing a Microsoft platform, even today. DirectX was decided upon, along with a custom version of Windows for the operating system. The thinking being that this would make it far easier for games to be developed for the system, with it essentially being a fairly normal PC at its core. It was built around using traditional PC components. This would, theoretically at least, make sourcing parts far easier and cheaper than the expensive development and production techniques used in traditional consoles. Sony famously spending well over a billion dollars in manufacturing facilities alone just for the PS2. Initially, AMD silicon was used for the prototype units. However, a switch to Intel Pentium 3 was made just before the official reveal. AMD weren't told prior to the reveal of the Switch, in a similar way to how Nintendo had neglected to mention stepping away from their partnership with Sony before the reveal of the ill-fated Nintendo PlayStation add-on. Early on, it was decided that an internal hard drive would be included in the console. It was felt that this would set it apart from the competition and allow them to focus on an online feature set at a system level. An 8GB hard drive was included, making it the first console in history to be released with one. This would give gamers more or less unlimited space for save games straight out of the box. Soundtracks could be ripped from CDs and played back on the console without needing the disc to be present, something that was taken advantage of in certain games allowing for custom soundtracks. It wouldn't be possible to install games to the hard drive, at least before the modding scene took off after release, so games were limited to being loaded from the game's disc drive. DVDs were the media format of choice, having a good trade-off between storage space and production cost. The PS2 could natively play DVD movies at launch without the need for any additional hardware or peripherals, so you'd think that using the same medium, this would also be the case with Microsoft's Challenger. However, it was not. A DVD remote and IR sensor was required to be purchased separately in order to enable DVD playback. Normally, I don't make a big deal out of the controllers in these videos, unless there's some kind of controversy or something unique about them. The Xbox launched in North America and Europe with what was known as the Duke controller. On paper, the Duke was basically the same as the PS2's DualShock controller, two analog sticks, a D-pad, four face buttons, start and select, and some shoulder buttons, with both featuring motors for vibration and feedback. However, the Duke was huge, nearly three times the size of the PS2's controller. This was down to a disagreement with Mitsumi Electric, who was supplying the controllers. A folded and stacked circuit board design was requested by Microsoft, and designed similar to that of the DualShock. However, Mitsumi refused to manufacture this for Microsoft, leading to a much larger controller having to be made in order to compensate. The Duke never released in Japan, with the small S pad being the launch model in that territory and eventually making its way worldwide. The S was designed for users with smaller hands and featured design that became the standard for Xbox moving forward, with later controllers closely following the design. Several names and abbreviations for Microsoft's new console were thrown around throughout the development process. The Windows Entertainment Project and Mind, or Microsoft Interactive Network Device, were considered, along with the Direct Xbox. The latter was used during internal communications frequently, and eventually got short onto just Xbox. Focus testing is showing that the name was also incredibly popular with gamers, and so the Xbox was born.
The Xbox was first announced at GDC in 2000, with some early demos and details about the hardware being shown. The console was officially unveiled to the public at CES in 2001, presented by Bill Gates and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The price and a good selection of launch games were subsequently announced later that year at E3. It released later the same year in North America on November 15th, 2001, which just happened to be three days prior to the release of the GameCube, Nintendo's entry into the sixth console generation. Three months later it hit European shores, and Japan followed another month after that. A spectacular launch event took place in New York at Times Square, with Gates in attendance, personally selling the first console at the event and playing games with those present. It was a record-breaking launch, with over 1.5 million units sold in the month and a half to the end of 2001, with 600,000 being sold in the first three days of sale. By 2004 it had sold over 15 million units, and over 24 million by the end of its life. The Xbox was competitively priced at launch, retailing at $300, the same price as the PS2. This cost Microsoft a huge amount of money though, each console sold cost them somewhere in the region of $125 just to manufacture. This further increased in 2002, when the price was dropped to a mere $200. It was commented on recently, with it being said that Microsoft has still never sold a console at a profit to this day. In a similar way to how Sony had no internal studios to handle game development when it first entered the market with the PS1, Microsoft set out to get publishers and developers on board with the Xbox early in development. The similarity to PC hardware made porting PC games an obvious choice, but they also went out of their way to acquire new studios to help increase the number of games available on the platform. Talks began in 2000 with Sega in order to allow Dreamcast games to be played on the Xbox in some manner. The Dreamcast was failing and was discontinued within a year or so of this and was seen as a potential way to benefit both platform holders. Talks eventually broke down however, with Sega's online service being a point of contention, with neither side being able to agree on how SegaNet should be implemented. Microsoft had convinced industry veterans such as Bethesda to bring their games to the platform the port of The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind making its way to the Xbox. In perhaps the strangest move of the era, Microsoft attempted to buy up several big name publishers, namely EA, Nintendo and Square Enix. Talks didn't get very far with any of these companies, with Nintendo apparently laughing their asses off at the idea, rather unsurprisingly. They did however manage to acquire Bungie in 2000. Off the back of their success with the Marathon games and Oni, Bungie set out to make a third person shooter for the Mac. This game was Halo Combat Evolved. It went on to be a launch title for the Xbox, it was changed to a first person shooter, and it took the world by storm. Its protagonist, the Master Chief, became a mascot of sorts for Microsoft and the Xbox, and remains one of the flagship titles today. In 2000, Microsoft moved its pre-existing games department and formed Microsoft Games, a dedicated division that would be handling all of its gaming endeavours from then on, consolidating all of its acquisitions under one department and handling both development and publishing duties. Online functionality was something that Microsoft had been thinking about from the very start with the Xbox. It was instrumental in influencing the decision to include a hard drive with the console. Xbox Live launched in November of 2002, exactly a year after the console launch in North America. Requiring only a broadband internet connection, it was a paid service that brought both online play and downloadable content to the Xbox. It retailed at $50 for a year subscription, but for the same price as a new game. It gained popularity very quickly, amassing over 100,000 subscribers in its first week and grew up to 250,000 in two months, hitting over a million subscribers by April of 2004. Halo 2 was the most popular game on Xbox Live and by extension the most successful game on the console, with 8 million copies sold. Unlike today, most downloadable content was available for free, with the exceptions of content from Microsoft owned IPs. Most of the content that was available took the form of additional maps for multiplayer games. Many also had online features that took advantage of the platform, even if they didn't have online multiplayer, such as leaderboards. Xbox Live on the original Xbox was shut down in April of 2010, the Xbox 360 having been around for several years at this point, with its own version of the service that improved on it in every way. The Xbox is a great console still to this day. It kickstarted Microsoft in the gaming industry, and pushed forward the console's role in the home, bringing online play to the homes of men in a way not done before on a console. It was by far the most powerful piece of hardware on the market, dwarfing the GameCube and PS2 in terms of raw power and technical ability. It was officially discontinued in 2006 in Japan, and later in Europe and North America. It received regular releases until 2007, 
the slew of sports games from that point until its final game being released in 2009. While it didn't come anywhere close to beating the sales of the PS2, selling around 24 million units to Sony's 160 million units, it came home comfortably in second place ahead of the GameCube and the Dreamcast, solidifying themselves as a real contender in the home console market. Game series that have gone on to define the industry started life on Xbox, notably the Halo series, which has gone on to sell well over 80 million copies since its launch in 2001, making it one of the highest grossing media franchises of all time. The Xbox received ports of PC games that should have been impossible, yet somehow managed to pull them off. Doom 3, Half-Life 2 and Morrowind shouldn't have been possible on the hardware that the Xbox had, but somehow released in a relatively uncompromised state. Something that wasn't achieved on other platforms for at least another generation. I still look back on the original Xbox fondly, so much so that I have two of them. Going back and playing these games is easier than ever thanks to Microsoft's excellent backwards compatibility features in every console thereafter. A large library of games work on modern hardware, both from disc and digital, with a lot of games being able to be picked up very cheaply. So if you're unfamiliar with the original Xbox, there's never been a better time to try out some of these classic games. Thank you for watching. If you've managed to get this far into the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing for more content like this. Did you have an Xbox? What was your favourite game for it? And did you play games on Xbox Live? Let me know down in the comments.